Well, today we're going to begin a new series that's going to take us all the way up to Holy Week. And so you're at the very beginning of it. You, might, you realize that Lent started this last Wednesday. And those of you who are celebrating Lent and you have chosen to uh, either reflect or fast or whatever you've chosen to do, you realize that there is no reflection or fasting, uh, any of that uh, foregoing on Sundays. Because Sunday is not a day where you fast, but you celebrate. And uh, you celebrate, so that means you get to eat today if you're holding off on something, okay? And that very timely, because we're going to talk about Jesus, seeing Jesus as he saw himself. And so I got a, a picture up there of Jesus looking into the mirror and uh, looking at himself. And uh, when we look at Jesus as he saw himself, in the Gospel of John, he tells us several times an expression. He says, I am, and then he mentions something. I am the bread. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I, I am the light. I am, and he's got all of these. I am the vine. I, I, I am, I am, I am. Today I want to look at the one, the very first one that we come across. Jesus said about himself, I am the bread of life. Now, some of you probably have been fasting. In fact, I, told, I mentioned this on Wednesday at our, our Ash Wednesday service that Everybody fasts every day. When you go to bed at night, okay, for the next however hours you sleep, you've exchanged eating with sleeping. And then as soon as you get up in the morning and you start to eat, you have a meal that we call break fast. Oh, breakfast. We have breakfast. And, and so everybody does a little fasting. Uh, and, and you get hungry. We, we talked about Jesus that he was in the wilderness for 40 days or 40 nights fasting. He didn't eat. And the text says, and he was hungry. <laughs> I like that. It's, it's, it's okay to get hungry. Now, I notice every now and then that somebody, uh, you know, when I have a longer message, looks over at their watch, and they say, why? Because their some, stomach is telling them, he should wrap it up here so I can go eat, eat. We like to eat, don't we? I mean, now, come on, let's face it, we like to eat. Uh, sometimes it doesn't even taste good, but we're hungry, we eat it anyway. But if it tastes good, oh my goodness, that's even better. Because then you'll overeat, and then you don't feel good later because you've overeaten, right? You know how this all works, come on. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. So bread is something you eat. You partake of it. And without bread, without food, you die. That's just the, that's the way it is. What he is saying is, you need me. Turn to the person next to you and just tell them, you need Jesus. Just tell them that. Turn them, you, you need Jesus. Yeah. Now, now turn to that same person and say, you know what? I need Jesus. <laughs> yeah, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. You see, Jesus is the bread of life. I want to jump in. And look at the passage here in John chapter 6. I can't get through all like 70-some verses of it today unless I preach till midnight. But we're not going to do that, okay? Uh, how did people see Jesus? We're, we're told at the very beginning. The people saw Jesus as a miracle worker. The chapter begins. There's crowds amassing. Jesus is on a mountain. He turns to the disciples and said, how are we going to buy something for all of these people to eat? Where are we going to get something for them to eat? Uh, it was Philip that says, hey, you know what? A year's wages won't buy enough for everybody here to eat. And then Andrew kicks in. He says, oh, but there's a little guy here. He brought his sack lunch. He's got a fish fillet sandwich. I think he stopped at McDonald's. No, you know, he's got the, the loaves and the fishes. And... Uh, then he adds this. He's both optimistic and pessimistic at the same time. We got this lunch. That's optimistic. The pessimistic, what is it among so many? And that's the way we go to God. We're optimistic that God can do it because he's done it for everybody else, but will he do it for me? Isn't that right? We're, a little, we're, like, we're just like Andrew. Andrew said, so what are they among so many? And Jesus said, have everybody sit down. And he, he blesses it, and then he apportions it out. And, and, and you know this Bible story. You've known it since you're a child growing up in Sunday school. You know this story that, that they fed everybody and then, so that there would not be any waste. 
you know, he must have listened to my mom. We didn't waste anything. <laughs> Lest there be any waste, collect everything left over, and when they collected it all, there were 12 basket full of the fragments from the little boy's fish fillet sandwich. Isn't that great? The miracle. The people. How did they see Jesus? They saw him as a miracle. The five loaves and the two fishes, but what are they among so many? And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them. So those who were seated, and he says, and so the fish, and they all had the fish as much as they wanted. One of the other gospels says they had it till the full. It wasn't like everybody got a little bite. You see, I could have probably fed the 5,000 with that, but you would have got a crumb. But they were all full. This was miraculous. So suppose you were there and you're watching this all happen. What do you think of this Jesus? You kind of like this guy. He just bought my lunch. <laughs> he just bought my lunch. The second thing they saw in him, they saw Jesus as a prophet. You see, when Jesus did this, in their minds, come on, they're Jewish, they're connecting dots. This guy did something very parallel to what happened in the wilderness when they were wandering. They were without food, and all of a sudden in the morning there was this white stuff all over the ground. It was manna, and there was this guy by the name of Moses that they were held accountable to that. And Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15 and verse 18, said that God was going to raise up a prophet like himself. And when the people saw the sign that had been done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who was coming into the world. He's here. Whoa. We got a miracle worker. We got a prophet who's a man of God. This is the eyes of the people. Wow, this is great. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force and make him king. Oh, you see what they wanted to do? Let's, make, let's put this guy in charge. Think about it. If he could do that, what could he do if he were the king? And so it was not time for Jesus to be king. And so they were going to take and make him king by force. He, they saw him as the potential king. If he could do that, then he could throw off the Roman Empire. He could get me a retirement check. <laughs> I could quit working. I don't need to. Hey, he could produce enough food for all of us. Let's put this guy in charge. But Jesus withdrew to the mountain by himself. He withdrew from, the mount, from them to the mountain by himself. Matthew gives us a little longer version that, than what we're getting here in the Gospel of John. and He's telling the same story. And he says that Jesus went up on the mountain to pray. To pray. They're all trying to tempt him with flattery, to be king. And Jesus says, you know what? I need some time with my Father in heaven. Now, he first tells the disciples, get onto the boat, go across the Sea of Galilee, and I'll meet you on the other side. And he's up on the mountain praying. Now, <clears throat> the fourth watch of the night, he stops praying and he looks down and he sees the disciples struggling in a storm on the sea. I just love this passage. The fourth watch is somewhere between 3 and 6 o'clock in the morning. It was on that fourth watch, not before it, but so sometime between 3 and 6 in the morning, he stopped praying. Wait a minute. If he started praying when he left the crowd and went up on the mountain, he's probably been praying from like 6 o'clock at night to 6 in the morning. Whoa. That blows my mind. You know, I want a guy like that praying for me. You know the scriptures tell us that a guy like that prays for me? Jesus is my mediator in heaven, and he mediates for me. He's been praying, and he looks down, and he sees the disciples struggling. And so <clears throat> he goes down and walks across the water. You know the story. It's a, little, it's a little more elongated in the Gospel of Matthew than it is in John. But he's walking across because in John said, so Jesus was walking on the sea, coming near the boat, catch up with the disciples. And they were afraid. Matthew said, they thought it was a ghost. This is my favorite Halloween story for the kids. A real ghost story. 
They thought it was a ghost. Peter recognizes who he is. John doesn't record this. Matthew does. Because John is more concerned about all the reactions of the people here than he is about the story of the disciples. In any case, Matthew tells us that Peter says, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come out on the water. He goes out walking on the water. When he takes his eyes off of Jesus, he sinks. And there's a, there's a sermon there too, isn't there? When we take our eyes off of Jesus, we begin to sink. It's just that simple. Then Peter prays the opposite of Jesus. Jesus has been praying for like 12 hours that night. Peter prays the shortest prayer in the Bible. Lord, help! <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Save! The Lord reaches down and says, Oh, you of little faith, pulls them up out of the water. They get in the boat. and by, The text says they were immediately to the other side. Some people miss that part of the miracle. Here they were in the middle of the of the Sea of Galilee, as soon as he got in the boat, boom, they're at shore. Wow. He, he, he is the Lord over creation. He is the, he's the Lord master of all of creation. Jesus was walking out of the water, coming near, and they said, said to him, uh, it, he said, it is I, don't be afraid. Then they were glad to see him, and they got in the boat, and immediately the boat was at land to which they were going. He was missing in action because when the crowd saw that Jesus was not on the other side, where he'd been up on the mountain praying and he performed the miracle of, of feeding the 5,000, when they, when they saw he wasn't there, they got in the boats and they went, I like this, seeking Jesus. You see, Jesus is worth pursuing in their, their perspective. And when they found that he was on the other side, they said to him, Rabbi, teacher, when did you come here? How did you get here? When did you come? We just saw you last night on the other side. We saw you didn't get in the boat. How'd you do this? How'd you do this? They knew that he was worth pursuing. So what I'm trying to say here, in the beginning of this passage, they saw Jesus as a miracle worker, as a prophet, as a king, as missing in action and worth pursuing. Miracle worker, man, if he could do that, he could do something else for me. A prophet, We've been waiting for a guy like this to show up. A king. Let's put him in charge. I'm going to put him in charge. Missing. Wait, where'd he go? Just when I need him, where is he? Worth pursuing. I better, I better go find this Jesus. My question is, so how do you see him? That's how the crowd saw him. How do you see Jesus? Is he your miracle worker, that, you know, your, your go-to guy when everything else has failed? I, I'll go to Jesus. Is he the prophet? He's got some really good things to say. That's what a prophet does. He preaches. Is he the king? Come on, really. Is he the Lord and the master of your life? Is he kind of missing in action? Oh, you get through your day and you all of a sudden say, whoa. Where's the Lord? I, I feel like I'm on my own here. You ever feel like that? Ooh. Worth pursuing. You know what? I need to pursue him even more. How do you see Jesus? That's the question I want to ask. Well, the second thing I want to notice here is how Jesus saw them. Ooh, we just saw how they saw Jesus. So how does Jesus see them? Well, according to the passage... He's dealing with a selfie generation. Now, they didn't have the phone, you know, taking their own picture. I could have just seen that, you know, Peter out on the water. Hey, I got to get this one. <laughs> hey, Jesus, could you move over a little bit? I want to get you in here too. No, it wasn't like that. Jesus answers them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me. He puts it right out there. They're seekers. Not because you, you saw the, the sign, but because you ate and you were filled. He said, it didn't change your heart. You're looking for me to fill your belly. I want to change your heart. And a lot of people see Jesus as someone who can get me out of the jam, and then they want to go back to their old ways. Jesus wants your heart. Because if he gets your heart, he'll change your ways. It's just that simple. It's the way it works. 
He sees them as not being legitimately honest about Jesus, but all about themselves. Wow. He sees them as spiritual freeloaders. Do not labor for the food that perishes. They wanted all the external. But he says, but for the food that endures to eternal life, you're focused on the physical and not the spiritual. The food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, it's a free gift from God. That's what the Bible says. It's not of works lest any man should boast. It's the gift of God. For on him, Jesus, God the Father has set his seal. I am the anointed Messiah. I am the Christ. I am really the king, but not the king that you want. I'm the king that God wants. And you need to line up with what God wants and not just what you want. And so they're spiritual freeloaders. They want to freeload off of those who truly believe. They want to be in that crowd. They want to, want to get a spillover of the blessing rather than be in the blessing themselves. He saw them as contentious. They're contending their own position. They said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Well, so what do I got to do to get in on this? They're still not getting it. It's not what you do. It's what you believe. And what you believe changes your heart, so then you do. Because your heart has been changed. To do something to get it is to reform yourself. To have your heart changed is regeneration to be a whole new person. Because of faith in your heart. Because of faith in your heart. They were contentious and Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. That's what God wants you to do. Truly believe. Not just on the surface. Deep down in the depth of your heart, believe that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That he is your Lord, that he is your Savior. He wants you to believe. How did Jesus see them? He saw them as arrogant. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe? They are so arrogant. Here they are in front of the Son of God, the Christ, the real King. Here they are in front of the one who performed the miracle, and now they're telling him, we don't believe what you did, so show us something more. You know what they're doing? Instead of bowing before Jesus, they're saying, Jesus, bow before me. Instead of putting myself under your authority, I'm putting myself above you, Lord. I am so arrogant. I'm telling you what to do. Jump through my hoop. Do a sign. They're dictating the terms of how they will believe. Folks, it's not the way it works. We humbly bow ourselves and we kneel before Jesus. What work do you perform for us? If you will do my bidding when I snap my fingers, then I'll believe you. It's not the way it works, folks. They're so arrogant. And here's what they bring up. See, they've been connecting dots. Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness, as it was written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Are are, are you really greater than... Moses, who gave us the manna in the wilderness, hey, he did it every day for six days of the week, and they gave you a double portion on the Sabbath day, or on the Friday, so that you would have enough for the full Sabbath day, and you didn't have to go get any on that day, that, that next day. And it went on for 38 years. Are you greater? Can you do that? Show us a sign. These arrogant people, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, It was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. Your theology is all messed up. You missed a key important ingredient in the whole story of the Old Testament. It was my Father that gives you the true bread from heaven. It was a Father back then that gave you the bread, and it is a Father who's giving you, and calling himself, the bread of life. I am the bread of life. 
the Father sent the Son into the world. They were so arrogant in the eyes of Jesus. They were also demanding. Because Jesus said, For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. <laughs> He's talking about himself. He's the bread of, bread of life. But instead of his way, they wanted it their way. Sir, give us this bread always. Give it to us every day. We want it all the time. Give it to us. Not that they would politely ask for it. They demanded it. So Jesus saw them as a selfie generation, all about themselves. Spiritually freeloaders trying to get in on the good thing that was happening. Contentious, arrogant, and demanding. How does Jesus see you? Whoa. Does he see me as a self-centered, selfish person? Or is my life about Jesus? Does he see me as a spiritual freeloader? Does he see me contentious, arrogant, and demanding that it's got to be my way? How does he see me? These are hard-hitting questions from our passage here. Finally, we get to how Jesus saw himself. We saw how the masses saw him. We saw how he saw the masses. And now we're going to see how Jesus sees himself. Jesus tells them, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. When you partake of Jesus, you partake of life. The wages of sin is death, the Apostle Paul said. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. In. You know, often when I'm sharing my faith one-on-one, I'll take my, my Bible out and I'll open it up, and I'll put whatever I got in my pocket, if it's a 5, a 1, a 10, 20. I don't think I've ever put a 50 or a 100 in there. I guess those just aren't in my pocket. And I'll say, hey, I want this to represent eternal life. And I'll put it in my Bible and close it. I'm going to say, then I say, how do you get eternal life? How do you get the money? Well, they say, well, you've got to take the Bible open it up and get it out. And that's exactly, eternal life is in Jesus Christ. You cannot get eternal life without receiving Jesus Christ. Because the gift of God, life, he's the bread of life. Life is in him. You have to partake of him. You've got to have Jesus. And if you don't have Jesus, you don't have life. It's that simple. He goes on and he says, not only Jesus said unto I am the bread of life, but he says, whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. He's really starting to mix the metaphor. This bread is like a flow of water, too, because he's really not talking about the Lord's Supper. He's not talking about, you know, your your fish fillet sandwich, the bread. He's not talking about that, the physical. He's talking about the spiritual. He is the bread of life, and like you eat food and you drink to sustain your physical life, you must have Jesus to sustain your spiritual life. It's just that simple. If you want to be satisfied and full and never hunger and never thirst spiritually, you have got to have Jesus in your life, for he's the one who fills and satisfies. He's the satisfier of life. He goes on, he says, and and he's the object of our faith. But I say unto you, you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. The problem is you put your faith in yourself and not in me. All that the Father gives me, they come to me. See, to believe means you come to Jesus. The men's group is doing a Bible study now called Not a Fan. Not a fan, but a follower. Not watching it all happen. Not watching the Christian faith happen in other people's lives. You're in the grandstands watching it all happen. But you get in the game. You play the game. You're a follower of Jesus. You're following the steps of Christ. He says to me, believe and come to me. You get in the game. Come on, be a part of this. Follow me. Come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. This is our assurance, folks. 
I came with a childlike faith at eight years old. And I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I've told you my story several times. He will never, ever cast me out. I'm a part of the family of God. I could change my name. I'm still in the family. I could do some pretty nasty, terrible things. Still in the family. When I say I'm sorry, I confess my sin. He's faithful and just to forgive me. And I restore it all over again. He never, ever casts me out. Wow. Jesus saw himself as the one who came down from heaven. For, uh, he says, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. I've come to do the Father's will. The Father sent the Son into the world to be the Savior of the world. Both John's Gospel and 1 John tell us that. Not to do my will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up in the last day. I am so eternally secure in Christ when I place my faith in him. And I was born again, born of the Spirit of God, placed in the family of God. He will never, ever let me go. You see, he sees himself as the eternal life giver. I didn't know whether to put an elevator there or the escalator for the big ride up into the sky. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Wow. That makes Christians pretty fearless. We are living in an age right now with a lot of fear. I've never seen people so afraid of something so invisible as a virus. <laughs> right? I even read one author saying the problem with all of this is the Christians. The Christians don't have any fear of death. Why? We know we're going to heaven. If I die, I'm going to heaven. It's that simple. Heaven, which is far better, because Christians have this theology... They're not afraid, and so they don't wear masks. Well, well, we're not stupid, are we? The Lord said, do not put the Lord your God to test. Okay? So he wants us to be wise. There's a whole book of Proverbs that talks about being wise. We, we do wear masks. We, we do take preventative measures. But we know the virus is so small that even with an N95, it can get through. And I could be in that 5% that actually get it and still die. <laughs> Are you kidding me? You know what? But I don't live a life of fear. I'm as wise as I can be. And, and I live because I know that even if I die, it's far better. <laughs> I'm taking the escalator <laughs> to my home in heaven. Listen. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They got hung up on a little sticking point. These Christians have no fear. He came down from heaven. He said that. That's blasphemy. And I'm stopping here at verse 40. There's like 30 more verses yet to go in this, this discourse about Jesus being the, the bread of life. And, and it's going to wind up in verse John 6, 6, 6, where the, disi the disciples weren't having a problem with this. But all the other people that were following him, all these seekers, all these people that talked about this passage, it said they turned, all those disciples left him. All the seekers, they left him. Because he started to say some hard things like, you must eat my body and drink my blood. And they're thinking, physical, cannibalism, what's wrong with this guy? He's crazy but he's been setting the stage. I'm talking spiritually. You really got to have a relationship with me. That was too much for them. They turned away. In John 6, 6, 6, it says they turned and departed from him. And then Jesus turns to the disciples and said, will you also turn away? And they said, where will we go? Only you have the words of eternal life. So how do you see him today? I just want to wrap up with this. How do you see him today? 
Do you see him as he sees himself, the bread of life? I cannot live without him. I have to have my morning time with him. I get into the word, I pray, or maybe it's your evening time. But man, I've got to have a meal every day. I've got to have some time with the bread of life. It will change your life if you do. Do you see him as a satisfier of life? Because of that time with him, he gives me meaning and purpose. He opens my eyes through the day to people in need or to a truth or, or, or a blessing that I would have missed otherwise because I have a relationship and I'm living off the bread of life. He's the satisfier of your soul. Is he truly the object of your faith? Or are you trusting still in yourself? Are you saying, he is my Savior, he is my Lord, he is my God? How do you see him? Do you see him as the eternal life giver? I know for sure that I have the gift of eternal life that he has given me. That brings so much peace and confidence courage, fearlessness that you know that you have eternal life from him. Jesus saw himself as the bread of life. I want you to see him that way too. Let's pray. Father in heaven, perhaps there's someone here today or someone watching online streaming who says, you know, I need the relationship with Jesus where he is the bread of life. He gives me strength in the inner person from participating and partaking of him through faith where he gives me eternal life, the forgiveness of my sins. A day ultimately in heaven, I need that. Lord, I pray for the person who's recognizing that, that they'll say right now, Lord, I make you my Savior, my God, the Lord of my life. Be the bread of life that, that I partake of. It gives me all the benefits of knowing Jesus in a personal way. Lord, you'll see the faith, not the works, the faith. And you will change that person from the inside out. All for your glory. I pray there's someone right now saying, Lord, save me. Like Peter said, Lord, save, help me with a faith in their heart that you will, because we know that you will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.